I've come back from my great adventures to your lowly tavern to help you out with whatever miserable needs I, Paladin Indigo. Bop, bop, bop. No, you have to say I, subclass Paladin Indigo now, because you're a champion, actually. Yeah, but it just, it just doesn't sound as cool. Yeah, I mean, I get where you're coming from. Sorry, buddy. Hi everyone, welcome to Game Gorgon. My name is Crew. I'm Indigo. Today we're here to talk to you about the champion. I'm sorry in advance for when I say paladin instead of champion. This is gonna get confusing for you. Champion was a name change that they made because a lot of people were complaining saying, I don't want to be forced into a specific alignment based yes. off of a class, which you still kind of are in this. You yes. are required to play some sort of good character, but it does not uh, force you to be ca uh, lawful good. Right. The non-good aligned paladins will probably be their own thing. And it will come in a later book. Yeah, I was gonna say, if I could be so bold, for now. Yeah, exactly. Just fly. As a champion, you're gonna get the following proficiencies. Look at these things, they are so cool. There's actually one interesting thing here. You'll notice that you're trained in one skill based on your deity. As a champion, you do have to pick a deity. That's a huge part of your class. The skill that you get trained in is based off of this list of deities that's actually enormous. Probably best for you to look at it in the book. There's not really a great way for me to fit it on the screen. Probably. The first thing that we're going to be talking about is the champion's code. Since right now we only have good champion causes, the only champion tenants that we have are called the tenants of good. Presumably, there will be a tenants of evil at some point. As a good champion, you must never perform acts anathema to your deity or willingly commit an evil act, such as murder, torture, or the casting of an evil spell. You also must never knowingly harm an innocent or allow immediate harm to one through inaction when you know that you could reasonably prevent it. This tenet doesn't force you to take action against possible harm to innocents at an indefinite time in the future or to sacrifice your life to protect them. There's like seven dragons that are gonna eat this town's person and I'm level three. Cool, he's dead and I can't do anything about it or else I will also die. Goodbye. I don't like it. I didn't mm -hmm. do it to him. Mm -hmm. I don't have the ability to, and so I do not have to try because these tenets don't force me to be stupid. The next thing you are going to be doing is choosing your deity and your cause. The deity is going to be on that list that we have already presented. Whoosh. You're allowed to be slightly off alignment from right. that deity still has to be an alignment that is accepted for its followers. Right, if you are picking a lawful good deity, you cannot be a chaotic evil character. Correct. I mean, it, it technically is an option as a champion because it doesn't say that you have to be that specific alignment, right? You can play chaotic evil. You just get none of the paladins. <laughs> <laughs> you get none of the champion benefits other sure. than like, uh, spe weapon specialization yeah. and like all of the general You're just stuff. a terrible fighter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you're allowed to play it that way if yeah, you okay, want. Okay, yes, you're allowed. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. This is a very open-ended game. Yes. But it's just really highly bad. Highly discouraged. Really bad decisions. <laughs> really bad. Unless that's like a really fun RP that you want to play. Yeah. The first one is the paladin, which is lawful good. As a paladin, you must follow these tenets. You must act with honor, never taking advantage of others, lying, or cheating. You must also respect lawful authority of legitimate leadership wherever you go and follow its laws. Oh, you know this king's an imposter, but it is the king. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, it's an imposter. F that guy. That is, I think the one most important thing about what we're discussing now is that do not think that you have to blindly follow to such an extreme that you seem like a moron, even to people that would follow your faith. Then it is the redeemer which is neutral good. As a redeemer, you must obey these tenets. You must first try to redeem those who commit evil acts rather than killing them or meting out punishment. If they then continue on a wicked path, you might need to take more extreme measures. You must also show compassion for others regardless of their authority or station. Lastly is the liberator, which is chaotic good. You must respect the choices others make over their own lives and you can't force someone to act in a particular way or threaten them if they don't. You must also demand and fight for others' freedom to make their own decisions and you may never engage in or condone slavery or tyranny. The liberator seems like a pain in the but. In Court of Corvids, the new Pathfinder 2nd Edition game mm -hmm. that we're going to be streaming starting August 28th, the entire party starts in what seems to be a utopian world. And you know, there isn't really slavery or, or tyranny or any sort of oppression whatsoever. So Liberator seems pretty chill to me. That's if things stay the way that they seem. They won't. Almost certainly. Look at look at the way he's behaving right now. With the champion, you have those three choices, right? 
But what do you get? What what benefits other than additional restrictions as a character <laughs> do I get? Well, at first, 9th and 11th, you're actually going to be getting bonuses. The first one you're going to be getting at first level is your champion's reaction, which as a paladin is going to give you retributive strike. You protect your allies and strike your foe. The ally gains resistance to all damage against a triggering damage equal to 2 plus your level. If the foe is within reach, make a melee strike against it. It kind of just lives in the world of paladin -y, which is like, I'm protecting my friends yeah. and hitting my enemies. <laughs> well, it's not a country song. At ninth level, you're going to get Divine Smite. As a paladin, this is an improvement to your retributive strike. If you hit with your retributive strike, the target takes persistent good damage equal to your charisma modifier. If you attack my ally and I get to use this feature on you, I'm going to deal persistent good damage to you, give them resistance to the damage. I'm going to do all this stuff. You shouldn't attack anybody that I like while I'm near them. At 11th level, you're going to get Exult, which is going to even further improve your retributive strike. When you use retributive strike, each ally within 15 feet of you with the target in their melee reach, each spend a reaction to strike the target with a minus five penalty. Which at the end of the day, this is basically like, yo, did you just hit my friend? Whoa, oh, whoa, whoa, you did whoa. not just oh, hit my friend. Oh, yep, oh it's everyone. going down. It's very paladin-y, I like this. Next we're gonna discuss Redeemer, the neutral good option for the champion, whose first level champion's reaction is going to be Glimpse of Redemption. Your foe hesitates under the weight of sin as visions of redemption play in their mind's eye. The foe must choose one of the following options. Quick break, I love the fact that they have to choose their own f***ed up thing. All right, all right, how? What me the least. <laughs> which one is the, which one? Oh. <laughs> the foe can either choose to have the champion's ally be unharmed by the triggering damage or have the champion's ally gain resistance to all damage against the triggering damage equal to two plus the champion's level. After the damage effect is applied, the foe becomes enfeebled two until the end of its next turn. So either mm. waste your attack or become enfeebled two and do less damage with your attack. If you've watched me play a paladin ever, it's been this because I love it so much. Mm -hmm. They have to pick their own demise. And both of those options are very good. Even though my enemy gets to make the decision, which you and I are both very against, like the player not being right. able to make the decision. Yes. I think this is still fun for the player because yeah. they're like, yeah, so uh, which one? Do you want to be uh, screwed or do you want to be screwed? Yeah. It's like as a player getting to tell the GM to roll a perception check. <laughs> and the GM's like, what do you mean? Here's where the pattern starts. At level nine, you're going to get Divine Smite. The foe that had to make the decision on Glimpse of Redemption is going to take persistent damage equal to your charisma modifier. If they choose to still damage your ally. Yes. If they don't choose to damage your ally, they don't take the damage. And I love that because that's what the Redeemer wants. They want you to be like, oh no, I changed my mind. I'm not gonna be mean to your ally. At 11th level, you're gonna get Exalt. You can apply the resistance granted by Glimpse of Redemption to yourself and all allies within 15 feet of you, including the triggering ally, except the resistance is reduced by two for everyone. Okay which is reasonable. I like it, I just don't feel it kind of fits the same redemption yeah. kind of. The, the previous two really fit the flavor of this very well, this one not so much. Yeah, and while I get that it's going to be probably a pattern that all of them kind of have the same kind of idea to yep. it, I just don't think it fits. Yeah. The final option you're gonna have for your champion is the Liberator, which is the chaotic good option. Mm. At first level's champion's reaction, you're going to get Liberating Step. You free an ally from restraint. If the trigger was an ally taking damage, the ally gains resistance to all damage against the triggering damage equal to two plus your level. The ally can attack attempt to break free of effects grabbing, restraining, immobilizing, or paralyzing them. They either attempt a new save against one such effect that allows a save, or attempt to escape from one effect as a free action. If they can move, the ally can step as a free action even if they didn't need to escape. That's a lot. Yes. Well, hold on, let me process it. Uh... Yeah, I'm not a fan, fan of this. Yeah. No, I kind of like see where they're going with it. I get the theme. I get the theme. Whether I like it or not I is something different. I still don't find it nearly as useful as the other two. No. I'd even say the theme is kind of boring. I think they're probably having issues because it's chaotic good. They're like, sure. okay, well, what's chaotic good? I know someone that does whatever they can to free people. We're gonna take that like philosophical idea and make it a literal thing, which is, hey, if someone has shackles or if they're like stuck in mud or yeah. something. They should have decided a fun set of mechanics for chaotic good 
and then been like, what did we just make? Mm -hmm. And then defined it. Instead of calling it Liberator, called it whatever made sense for the mechanics they built. I think that the restriction of freedom did this a disservice. Even if this is going to be the direction you want to take Liberator, which sure. it, it's perfectly fine. I just don't feel like it's as strong. Not only do you have to like use your reaction, but they have to make another escape attempt. It's not like you use divine magic to free them of their bonds, which would make this way stronger in my opinion. Maybe broken? I would agree, probably Probably broken. broken. That would fit the other two a little bit better, I think, mm -hmm. as far as like, none of them require any interaction from the person that you are applying the the reaction to. You probably failed the save for a reason. You, you're probably not very strong. So you get to roll again. Woo. Cool, you get you give your allies advantage in this situation. How often is this going to be coming up? The wizard is by the paladin on the front lines and you can get them to step for free and it's their turn next and they can run immediately afterwards. That's cool, but like that's really specific and it hinges on one of your players not understanding how they should position themselves. Mm, I'm not really into it. Yeah, maybe it gets better. Yeah. At ninth level, you get Divine Smite. If the triggering enemy was using any effects to make your ally grabbed, restrained, immobilized, or paralyzed, when you used Liberating Step, that enemy takes persistent good damage equal to your Charisma modifier. No. No. Mm -mm. Oh, now you're adding Charisma modifying damage, which yeah. is the same as everyone else, but it's in a super hyper specific situation. Yes. Freedom isn't free. It costs liberators like you and me. <laughs> And then at 11th level, you're going to get Exalt. You can help your whole group get into position. When you use Liberating Step, if your ally doesn't attempt to break free of an effect, you and all allies within 15 feet can step in addition to the triggering ally. Cool. cool. Cool, cool, cool. I can't see a step being that valuable that often. It's weak. I have an issue with some of the wording, which is you can help your whole group get into position. I'm going to be able to move my group into a, a, a beneficial position, but no, it's like, yo, if one of your members is has put themselves in a bad position, you can get them out and then move your group. This is only good for retreating. What other situation do you want your entire party to step other than they all want to disengage and run? If it's the paladin and then all the enemies go, the step is useless. As far as I can see. Prove me wrong in the comments, it's, I wanna it's know. It's retreat or very specifically, if your character is going out to free groups of people that have been dealing with tyranny and yes. has been in shackles. To say the least, we don't like it. Yes. That's not to say we don't like the entire champion. For Paladin and, uh, shit. <laughs> don't tell me. Liberate, nope. Retribution guy. Redeemer guy. There we go. If you think that you've got a really good idea for Liberator. Oh yeah. Let us know in the comment. I, because I I'm love okay. being proven wrong about uh, a class not being good. I love somebody being like, what about this? You're right, that's great. That feels great, do that to me, thanks. Okay, now we're stepping back to level one as a general champion. This isn't dependent on what your tenants are or anything like that. This is just stuff you get as a champion. We're gonna first talk about deific weapon. If your deity's favorite weapon is an uncommon weapon, you have access to it. You know, you're probably working for a temple or a church of some sure. sort. That is probably a key feature. You could probably grab one off a wall. Yeah, exactly. They're like, okay, our deity is really about this really rare weapon. Not rare, uncommon. uncommon. Now, if it's a simple weapon, mm -hmm. instead, because you already have access to it, you're gonna bump the damage die up by one step. And one step is basically one like larger size die. So if it's a D4, normally it's a D6 now, so on and so forth for every other dice. I can't tell which one I like better having access to a yeah. rarer weapon or just bumping up a, a, a damage die. I think you kind of have to assess, are you using shields? Do you want one hand or two hand? Like how are you building your character? And then look through the two handed simple weapons, look through the uncommon two handed weapons and kind of just compare them and keep in mind, look at the weapon trait. Depending on your deity, you're also going to get devotion spells, which are spells that are specific to your deity, mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to cast them with your focus points. Now, this is the only form of spell casting that the champion has. Mind you, you can take feats to gain additional ways of casting spells or even getting access to other like spell schools. Also at first level and every even numbered level thereafter, you're going to get access to a new champion feat. This is kind of cool because it does start on an odd number, which yep. means that you're going to get first, level, second, level. and then wait until fourth. Yep. Yeah. Also at first level, you're going to get shield block, which is going to give you the shield block feat. Wow. 
This was a super loaded first level. Yeah, again, it's it's less of a caster class. It is a pseudo martial with some light casting. Yeah, the same way that Bard was kind of the opposite. It had very light martial capabilities. Like it did get proficiency in some weapons. It does have light armor proficiency, but most of its stuff was the focus pool and the spells. We're not gonna be going over the generic stuff for this class. Like you get skill feats and you get general feats and you get, you know them by now. If not, go watch our first videos. Shame on you for not watching them already. Uh, don't feel bad. <laughs> I still like you, please come back. At third level, you're gonna get Divine Ally, which is going to be a choice that you get to make that isn't associated with your Paladin, Liberator, or Redeemer, which I really love this. You're gonna yeah. choose a different type of ally that you're going to be gaining and get benefits based off of that. The first choice you're going to have is Blade Ally. Select one weapon. In your hands, the weapon gains the effect of a property rune. For a champion following the Tenets of Good, choose Disrupting, Ghost Touch, Returning, or Shifting. You also gain the weapon's critical specialization effect. I wanna point out some key wording in there. Champions following the Tenets of Good, which implies that later on down the line. There are gonna be different tenants of not good, like exactly. neutral and evil, like we said at the beginning. Exactly. This is loaded. Like you get a property rune, all three of those are useful in one way or another and critical specializations. And the fact that you get to choose per day which one is going to be effective. Yeah, I think that, I think I undersold that in my head, but like if you lose a weapon, it's not the end of the world. The ally isn't the weapon, the ally imbues a weapon when you prep. So you can just like, oh hey, let me borrow this. Done, let's go. A spirit of protection dwells within your shield. In your hands, the shield's hardness increases by two and its HP and BT increases by half. This is more for a specific uh, champion that yes. you wanna play. The kind that I would play. Versus the, uh, the blade ally, which is like, I think that's good no matter which one of the three that you choose. Yep. This one's more of like, I'm a protecty guy. Yeah, item durability for a shield user is very important. If you're thinking of using a shield, mm -hmm. it's super important that you understand that stuff. Lastly is steed ally. You gain a young animal companion as a mount. Ordinarily, your animal companion is one that has the mount special ability. You can select a different animal companion, but this ability doesn't grant it the mount special ability. In D&D, they had this issue, which is like there was a paladin that allowed you to have like a mount and like all of your stuff was mount based and they're like, cool, you're in a dungeon. Oh, I become useless. Womp, womp. And this prevents that. It's yeah. like, cool, I don't want, uh, yes, steed, having a steed and having a mount is super helpful, but I'm aware that I'm also going to be in a dungeon. Right. Yeah. A fifth level, you're gonna get weapon expertise. Your proficiency with simple and martial weapons is gonna increase to expert. At level seven, you're gonna get armor expertise where you're training in light armor, medium armor, heavy armor, and unarmored defense increases to expert. Also, you gain the armor specialization effects on medium and heavy armor. That's nifty. I think that's the first time we've seen armor specialization effects come out in a class. Thus far, yes. Thus far. We're doing this in alphabetical order. Don't criticize us if you're watching this after we release Sorcerer. Yeah, because Sorcerer is definitely the one that's gonna have it. <laughs> no, but we'd be farther. <laughs> <laughs> At seventh level, you're gonna get weapon specialization. It's the same as we've said previously. In ninth level, you're gonna get champion expertise. This is gonna increase your proficiency with champion class DC, divine spell DC, and divine spell attack rolls to expert. It is. Cool. At ninth level, you're going to get juggernaut. You did say <laughs> it! Yes! I was so expecting it. Your fortitude saves increases to master, and when you make a successful fortitude save, it actually counts as a critical success. Yup, free natural 20, baby. Or 10 plus, remember. Oh, true, true. Free 10 plus, baby. In ninth level, you get lightning reflexes. This is gonna increase your reflex saving proficiency to expert. At 11th level, you're going to get alert, which is going to increase your proficiency in perception to expert. At 11th level, you get Divine Will. Nope. Divine Will. Yes. Your proficiency for will saves increases to master and you treat successes and will saves as critical successes. More free critical successes. <gasps> Scrumptious. At 13th level, you're gonna get Armor Mastery, where your proficiency in light, medium, heavy, and unarmored defense is going to increase to master. I don't see shields anywhere in these lists. Uh... At 15th level, you're gonna get greater weapon specialization. This is gonna increase your proficiency for simple and martial weapons to master. At 17th level, you're going to get champion mastery where guess what? Your weapon specialization 
increases. It does more damage. The ba based off of the training in which you have it. Flat damage math formula adjustment. At level 17, you're gonna get legendary armor. This is gonna take your proficiency with all of the armor and increases it to uh, legendary. That includes unarmored defense. Mm -hmm. Stay off my turf, dude. Th that's monk territory. Do you get it? Where do paladins get off? No, yes, but they we don't. They, they pray to God that so they're not allowed to get off. We haven't gotten legendary weaponry from from the champion. Yet. I don't care. I mean, shut your face. So you haven't gotten it. They haven't gotten it. You both get unarmored legendary status. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, at 19th level, the champion's going to get Hero's Defiance. You shout in defiance, filling you with a sudden burst of healing. Just before applying the attack's damage, you recover 10d4 plus 20 hit points. If this is enough to prevent the attack from bringing you to zero hit points, you don't become unconscious or dying. Either way, cheating death is difficult, and you can't use Hero's Defiance again until you refocus or the next time you prepare. Hero's Defiance can't be used against effects with death traits or that would leave no remnants, such as Disintegrate. Very strong. Yes. And it also has awesome flavor, because you can just shout like, I'm the Juggernaut <laughs> Out of the base choices, we agree that we only have two really strong choices and one that's like, oh, cool, we just tacked this on here. Yeah. I like the champion a lot, though. There's a lot of really fun flavor within there. There's very, very light spell casting. I also really like the way that they implement tenants here. I understand that you don't like it because it's like in two different places. I personally think that it is flexible. It allows them to grow it moving forward. More importantly than that stuff, it's not too restrictive while still like embodying the flavor of the character that the paladins, that the champion is supposed to represent. What do you think of the champion slash paladin? Uh, what do you think of them? Uh, is there any fun builds or ideas that you have? Do you have any predictions or desires for the future of the champion? Something specific for neutral tenants? <laughs> Head down to the comments and let us know what your thoughts are on all of that. Then hit the like button because it helps us immensely. Then if you haven't hit the subscribe button, hit that and make sure to not hit the bell icon because it's stupid and doesn't help us whatsoever. And then head over to Twitter and talk to us. You can talk to me there at IndigoQT. Hey, and you can talk to me on Twitter at KrugQTR. You can talk to both of us at all these social media things down here. Go to the description, click the Patreon button if you want to and have the ability to give us a little bit of money. It doesn't matter what the amount is. Well, okay, it doesn't matter what the amount is because there's a minimum for Patreon, but we'll see you next time. There's no maximum limit.